Welcome back. This is a very special film, an Academy Award winner for Best Picture, Best Director, Best Actor and Best Screenplay, beating out stiff competition in all those categories that year. It was the first independent small budget film to turn a big profit and create a climate where the studio supported low budget independent productions, changing the face of cinema as a result. And it's a simple, beautiful love story well told. It is Marty from 1955. Screenwriter Paddy Shevsky found the inspiration for this story when he stumbled across a Friday night friendship club meeting at the ballroom of the Abbey Hotel in New York City. Shevsky noted a sign near the ballroom entrance that read, Girls, dance with the man who asks you. Remember, men have feelings too. It gave him the idea for a play about a young woman attending a neighbourhood dance and an awkward man who does the same, and in the process, setting out to tell the most ordinary love story in the world. Shevsky wrote the play as a starring vehicle for his friend, actor-director Martin Ritt, which explains the title. However, Ritt had been blacklisted during the McCarthy era, and the TV network which was behind the Philco television play production in 1953 wouldn't allow him to appear, so the role went to Rod Steiger. Hecht Lancaster, the independent production company run by Harold Hecht and Burt Lancaster, took an interest in the material and this became their seventh production. Unusually for the time, writer Paddy Shaevsky was consulted extensively throughout. Delbert Mann had directed the original TV production and Shaevsky insisted that he direct the film in what would be his feature film debut. A decision was made not to cast Rod Steiger in the title role as the producers felt that the public would not pay to see the same actor they had seen for free on television. United Artists pushed for the casting of Marlon Brando as Marty as the studio felt that Brando was a more recognisable star and would give the film much more public appeal. Hector and Lancaster instead chose to pursue a lesser known cast for the film. Delbert Mann's friend, R. Robert Aldrich, suggested Ernest Borgnine for the lead. Burt Lancaster too had wanted to cast R. Borgnine since working with him on From Here to Eternity in 1953. And after Harold Hecht saw the television production, he too believed that Borgnine was, the, was right for the role. When reading for his part, Ernest Borgnine moved both screenwriter Paddy Shaevsky and director Delbert Mann to tears. When Borgnine had finished his read-through, both Mann and Shaevsky knew that they had found their Marty. The role of Clara initially was offered to Nancy Marchand, uh, who had played the character in the television version. However, Betsy Blair, who was Gene Kelly's wife at the time, was interested in the role and lobbied for it. Like Martin Root, uh, Blair too had been blacklisted for her Marxist and communist sympathies. Pressure from Kelly, who used his connections at MGM to pressure United Artists, one Blair would be the role of her lifetime. She won acting awards at Cannes and in Britain and picked up an Oscar nomination for her performance, but it didn't help her get off of the blacklist. Esther Minicotti, uh, who played Mrs. Poletti, uh, Augusta Cioli, who plays Aunt Catherine, and Joan Mantell, who plays Angie, repri reprised their roles from the television production. The screenplay changed the name of the Waverley Ballroom to the Stardust Ballroom. The film expanded the role of Clara and added subplots about Marty's career, his mother, and her sister. The most prominent uncredited role was Ralph, played by Frank Sutton, who was later made famous for his role as Sergeant Vince Carter uh, on Game of Pile USMC. Shooting began on September 7 of 1954 in the Bronx and included locations such as the Grand Concourse, Arthur Avenue, Gunhill Road, White Plains Road and several Bronx subway and elevated train lines. On-set filming took place at Samuel Goldwyn Studios in November of 1954, with the full shoot running only 16 days. Shaevsky had an uncredited cameo as Leo to save time and money on hiring an extra. While Shaevsky was paid $67 for his three lines, he was required to join the Actors' Union, which cost him $140. Partway through the production, United Artists threatened to pull the plug because other Hecht Lancaster films were well over budget. It was saved when the studio's accountants pointed out that under new tax laws, they had to complete the film and show it at least once before they could write it off as a tax loss. On its release, United Artists wanted to relegate the film to a second feature, but Pat Oshievsky insisted it, that it have some kind of first-run engagement. So it premiered at the Sutton Theatre in New York, which was normally a venue for art films. A campaign of private screenings, convincing major press outlets to feature it positively, getting influential columnist Walter Winchell to hail the film as one of the biggest sleepers in Hollywood history, generated a slow build in viewership. 
When the film won the Palme d'Or at Cannes, uh, this generated more press and more box office. As a result, it played 39 weeks at the Sutton to mostly packed houses. For subsequent openings, United Artists scheduled two weeks of screenings in various markets for community leaders to generate positive word of mouth. The move, uh, the move paid off, ensuring the film made a small profit on its initial release. Success at the Academy Awards led, led United Artists to reissue the film to 5,000 theatres. Now, while the film only cost $340,000 to make, it took $3 million at the US box office, making it one of the most profitable movies ever made. The film cemented United's artist's reputation as a haven for daring independent producers and inspired rival studios such as MGM and 20th Century Fox to also delve into small budget independent filmmaking. Now this film's included amongst the American Film Institute's 400 Greatest American Movies and their Top 100 Greatest American Love Stories. It was selected to the National Film Registry in 1994 and is included amongst the 1001 movies you must see before you die. So lots of reasons to watch this film. It's a mostly forgotten gem, a beautiful love story with offbeat characters, great location shooting, brilliantly shot in black and white, and as I said, uh, it's a film that changed the trajectory of American cinema. So what I suggest you do is that you go to our website, find our virtual screenings page, find the link to this particular film, click on it and watch it. Uh, as always, see what you think. We'd always love you to come back, uh, let us know what you thought about this particular film and whether you, we, we would recommend it for other people as well. And then we'll see you back again in the not too distant future for our next classic films review. Catch you next time.